Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome back to a new video. You can see plenty of C490 hardware here on my table because in today's video we are going to test the 10900 KF. The KF CPUs appeared with the 9900K, then Intel later announced the 9900KF, which is physically exactly the same CPU but with disabled internal graphics. It's me it means the internal graphics is still there, like physically the transistors are there on the chip, but it's disabled in any way. Not sure exactly how it's done, but the internal graphics cannot be used. It's the same on 9900KF or 10900KF. Therefore, CPUs itself should be completely identical, but there are myths out there that the KF CPUs overclock better because apparently, or some people are saying, that the power consumption is lower due to the disabled graphics and you have a larger die then that can be used for dissipating the heat. Therefore, the temperatures should be lower than on the 9900K or 10900K. That's what we're going to test today. And personally, I'm just asking myself the question if maybe the KF CPUs are CPUs where the internal graphics were like damaged or not good enough to pass some kind of testing and therefore Intel maybe decided, hey, let's just use this as a KF CPUs because the CPU cores are in perfect condition and therefore we can just use it without internal graphics. And then you also have to ask yourself the question, would you go for a KF CPU or not? The price difference is extremely small, at least here in Germany, talking about about 500 euro for a KF CPU versus 525 to 530 euro for a K CPU. And yeah, so you're saving like not, not even 5%. And then the question you can also ask yourself, would you ever need internal graphics? Like, would you ever need it? Because typically, if you get one of those K CPUs, you're, you're going to use it with like a 2080 Ti or 3080 Ti when it comes out, and then you're probably never going to use the internal graphics. Therefore, you can also save the 20 euro. That's up to you to decide. But first of all, let's check if there are any differences when it comes to the CPU itself, talking about temperatures or overclockability. You might remember a few videos ago we were already doing some testing with the Asus Maximus 12 Extreme board because I was presenting some overclocking or binning results of 30 10900 k CPUs. I was recording, it was all the same batch, but I was recording different temperatures and power consumptions within those 30 CPUs. So I was running Cinebench R20 at 5.1 GHz, 1.25 volt, and then keeping track of maximum power consumption and maximum temperature. And the values varied from 232 watt peak to 278 watt peak power consumption, and temperature was between 79 and 92 degrees Celsius. Therefore, there is definitely a variety within those CPUs, but we have data of 30 CPUs, which is perfect. And then we can maybe get a better view of the 10900KF. Otherwise, if you just take a single 10900K and compare it with a single 10900KF, you could easily get the impression that it's much better or much worse. While if you would compare like hundreds of CPUs, they are maybe completely identical. And I did this testing on this setup, therefore we're going to repeat exactly the same. Physically, both CPUs are identical. 10900KF is reading SRH92 and the 10900K is reading SRH91. Besides that and the different batch number, obviously no physical difference. As you can see, the identical setup to last time EK block with an EK custom water cooling loop with a 360 red and a DDC pump running at 100% pump speed right now. CPU is also correctly set at 1.25 volt and 5.1 gigahertz across all cores. Now once I started Cinebench R20, you will have to keep an eye on CPU package and CPU package power consumption. I noted the previous values down on the right. So the previous values were between 79 and 92 degrees Celsius max on the CPU package and CPU package power was between 232 and 278 watt max within those other 30-10900K CPUs. Just started Cinebench, have to rearrange the windows. The first impression looks like the CPU is running colder than the others on average. And CPU package power is on the lower end of the other CPUs. With this quick test, I think we already destroyed the first myth. With 79 degrees Celsius, the 10900KF was as cold as the coldest 10900K I tested. 
Obviously, to be fair, we should have tested also 30 10900K of CPUs, but I only have a single one. Therefore, it's quite difficult to get a 100% scientifically accurate um, impression right here. But just judging at this individual sample, I can say that it is as cold as the coldest 10900K I tested, but looking at the power consumption with 243 watt peak, we also had a 10900K which was peaking out at 232 watt in Cinebench R20. Therefore, I think it should be safe to say that the 10900KF and the 10900K won't differ much. Maybe they differ slightly. We would need more CPUs to be scientifically correct. But just judging by the individual sample, I don't see any difference between KF and K. Now you're probably asking yourself, why do you even care about voltages and power consumption? Why does it even matter? I just want to know how high I can overclock the CPU. And obviously you're kind of right. But I just wanted to give you first an impression of K versus KF difference, talking about power consumption and temperature regarding with and without internal graphics. Now we're changing for this MSI C490 Gaming Carbon Wi-Fi with this beautiful EK monoblock. I have this has been laying around here for like two or three weeks and I was just curious on how the voltage regulator temperatures will be under a load and therefore we will just change the 10900K FCPU on here and at the same time when we're testing also the CPU I can take a quick look at the VRM temperature of this thing and see how this mainboard overclocks. And here we have the MSI C490 Gaming Pro Carbon Wi-Fi. Personally, I'm a big fan of those carbon designs. I know that not everybody likes them, but since I'm really a fan of cars and most of the tuning parts on my cars are also made of carbon, I kind of like those designs. Quick look at the VRM, we can count 14 phases in total. The middle 12 are for CPU voltage supply. The one on the top right here is for the internal graphics of the CPU, bottom one is for system agent. And the 12 phases in the center for CPU vCore, those should be six real phases, 12 in total, they should be teamed. Teamed at least, teamed is what ASUS is calling it, I'm not sure how MSI is calling it. However, I cannot find any doublers on the back, but the VRM controller cannot handle so many faces, therefore it's six real faces made up to 12 with like a teamed configuration. The monoblock is EK quality and also looks pretty stunning, I think. Intake is here, then the water spreads to left and right, goes to the outside and then outtake is here. On the back, in the center, we have the CPU contact area, and maybe just ignore that I touched everything already. Two blocks right here for direct contact for the MOSFETs and also for the inductors. Added thermal pads and also the thermal paste. Therefore, next step is mounting the motor block. Sheik supervised my work and approved that everything was correct. Now I can proceed adding the mono block. Okay, maybe there is not enough water in there and there is certainly some air inside the loop. But maybe we can just appreciate for a second the beauty of all those bubbles squeezing through the cooling channels. I just like that. It just looks beautiful. Okay, but now it's time to add a little bit more water. Bundle is assembled. I also already spent the time pre-testing the CPU so we know what we're talking about. We're going through the BIOS settings in a second. It's just so if you want to repeat this, maybe if you want to get the same bundle, I think it's kind of interesting. You pay about 400 to 430 euro right now here in Germany for this bundle for a quite decent Z490 board, I think, when it comes to the accessories and with the monoblock temperatures will be absolutely perfectly in line. And then, yeah, you get Z490 with a monoblock for about 400, 430 euro. I think that's a quite okay price. Keeping in mind that in general the mainboard prices exploded somehow, but yeah, let's just go through the BIOS and through the OC settings. OC settings are quite simple. You go to the advanced menu, then OC on the left. Then you enter the CPU ratio of 52. As I said before, this is not 24-7 stable. This is just for a Cinebench run. For 24-7 stable, you would have to enter like 51 or 50 right here. Then AVX offset to zero, ring ratio to 48, loaded XMP profile here where you can see the enabled. So 4266 on the memory is running, fine, then on digit all power, set load line calibration to mode 3, so it's not dropping down that hard, and then core voltage to 1.32 volt, and also this setting is quite high for 24-7. For 24-7 you should probably aim for something like 1.25 volt. 
Okay, we're going to run SimageR20 in a second, just to give you one more impression of how the board looks like. I think this particular monoblock fits quite well on the board. You can see that it was especially designed for it, just like this line right here fits perfectly to the line of the mainboard cover. Yeah, quite nicely designed for sure. All right, Cinemage R20 is running. First look on the temperatures, you can see the maximum temperatures I had in a previous run, which I was doing for the German video, peaked out at 84 degrees Celsius, which is perfectly in line to our previous testing on the other ma mainboard with the different cooler. Checking VRM temperature, 52 degrees Celsius, that's also great. Now we can see package 85, considering that this is just a Cinemage R20 setting and not 24 seven, I think this is okay. Package power 240 watt, that's also in line. And final score of 6400 points in R20, considering our clocks, should also be okay. Now I'm going to run Prime95 for about 30 minutes just to see where the voltage regulators will peak out, but I will use 5.1 GHz at 1.25 volt, simply because this would be too much, I think it's not going to be Prime95 stable. VRM temperature also looked perfectly fine after 30 minutes, we peaked out at 63 degrees Celsius and that's considering that we're using a monoblock. It also depends on your water temperature. If you have a better cooling loop, it could also be 58 degrees Celsius, which does not matter whatsoever because if you're running 55 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Celsius, your VRM is not going to care and it's not going to limit your CPU at all. Therefore, running a monoblock is certainly great if you want to overclock it. Also board-wise, 4266 megahertz on the memory was no issue loading XMP considering I was using four DIMMs. 5.2 gigahertz R20 was no problem as well. And I mean, that's just pure luck on your silicon quality. And it's going to depend if you have a great CPU or if you had a have a bad clocker, then your mainboard is not gonna do much. In general, when it comes to the 10900 KF, you shouldn't expect more than from a normal 10900 K. They are not magically much better overclockers, which can get like 500 megahertz more. We would need more CPUs to get like a big picture and like a scientific impression if the CPUs in general are better or not, but I don't think so. I think it's the same manufacturing, just a disabled iGPU. You, you can save 20 bucks if you want to. If you're looking for 10900K and in general, at least in Germany right now, the availability is quite bad and you know that you're going to use a 2080 Ti and you're never going to use the iGPU you can just get a KF in CPU instead. Save a little bit of money, have the CPU, maybe better availability. I'm not sure how it looks right now, but those are pretty much the options. But overclocking wise, temperature, whatever, you should not expect more from a KF than from a K CPU. Thanks for joining in and see you next time. Thanks for jumping in, Sheik. <laughs> see you next time, bye.